One, two, one, two, three, one, two. Do 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 Hey Bill. Morning, Ken. How is birthday is it? Say again. Whose birthday? Oh, 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 I, yeah, I need to change that. It was a friend of my wife's. Um, it was a friend of my wife's, and I set it up, and I just need to change my virtual background. Good afternoon, teachers. Um, this is Ken Brandt, the director of the Robinson Planetarium, and I'm joined today by Jessica Seely, who's our uh, chief communications officer for the public schools and astronaut Bill MacArthur. Um, this is a very high honor to be sitting in the same Zoom room, but here we are. Um, let me introduce you to the Eclipse course you're taking. This is the introductory video for that course. Um, this Canvas course is designed to teach you how to safely teach students how to properly see a solar eclipse. We'll tackle how eclipses happen, what to do leading up to the eclipse, how to use eclipse glasses and pinhole projection methods to safely view the eclipse, uh, eclipses across the curriculum, and a resource guide. You can earn one CEU in content for mastery of this course. Mastery of this course means passing the quizzes. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so without further ado, I want to introduce our special guest today, um, Red Springs High School alumni, class of 69. Am I correct? That's correct. All right. And retired astronaut Bill MacArthur. Uh, Bill has flown in space multiple times with his longest voyage being commander of the International Space Station Expedition 12 back in uh, 2005 and 2006. Bill has a unique perspective regarding eclipses. And here's Bill to tell the story about the images you're about to see. Uh, th thanks, Ken. Uh, the you know, fl flying in space is just such a such a wonderful privilege, and I was particularly fortunate to be able to serve on board the International Space Station for six months. And what's so great about that is that instead of visiting space, we're actually living in space. And and uh, I, I flew on the space shuttle a few times, and I always like to tease my space shuttle colleagues that they only visited space that you needed to go to ISS to actually live there. So what I'd like to do is just share, uh, since we're talking about eclipses, I would like to share a, a really rare opportunity that my crewmate, a Russian Air Force Colonel Valery Tokarev and I had. So here, let's, oops. Um, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna hate to tell you, Ken, but you disabled screen sharing. So, uh, so I need to, I need to either you either need to enable my screen, or you just need to allow me to uh, to enable screen sharing. Uh, you want me to? I... Go ahead. So, um, the uh, I, I think you'll be able to see the slides now. The um, and again, it's just such a wonderful opportunity. Oops, I actually hit the share button. I think we're good now. There, goes. there you are. All right. And so it's just really a wonderful opportunity to fly in space because, especially for a long period of time, because we can see just so many phenomena, uh, features uh, on the uh, face of our planet. And it really does give you a deep appreciation for how wonderful uh, good, old, uh, good old planet Earth is. Um, the, uh, as Ken said, I've flown in space a few times, and here are the uh, uh, mission patches for the four missions. You may notice that they have they all have one thing in common, and that, that is they each have my name on them. And one thing uh, I will guarantee you, if NASA puts your name on a patch, you're getting ready to have a lot of fun. But we're going to talk about solar eclipses, 
And this one occurred uh, on my last mission. It occurred on March 29, uh, 2006, about a week and a half before Valeria and I returned to Earth. Now, it's sometimes difficult to describe what Earth really looks like from the space station. It does not look like this. We're at an altitude of about 250 miles. This picture was taken from a weather satellite called Meteosat 8. It was launched by, by the Europeans. And what's particularly interesting about this picture is this is the eclipse that we're discussing right now. But what did it look like to us from an altitude of only 250 miles, only 400 kilometers above the Earth's surface? And it was it was it was huge. Uh, it, it was it was quite big. It was so large that I could not capture the entire moon, the entire lunar shadow in one frame. And so I basically uh, took a whole series of pictures, and then the photo lab on the ground stitched them together. And this is what we this is what the eclipse looked like. Now, what's so rare about it is that the orbital track, the ground track of the space station uh, was overtaken by the ground track of the moon shadow. And so we actually were in the middle of the moon shadow. Now, we normally don't think about look when we're going to be outside looking at a solar eclipse, we don't really think about looking at the ground because all we're going to see is the shadow. We're, we're really focused on looking outward with appropriate protection to see the actual moon obscuring the sun itself. Well, the space station, when I was there, had most of the windows were on the floor, were in the deck. And so we normally face down toward the earth. And I had no windows that were in an orientation that would have allowed me to actually take a picture outward uh, looking uh, at the uh, at the moon at, against the sun's backdrop, unfortunately. But I'm going to fix that uh, next year. So anyhow, let me uh, let me get out of our screen sharing mode here. Try again. Oh, there we go. OK. OK. So, um, and then what was interesting is about nine days later, um, uh, Valeria and I returned to Earth, and it ended the 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 uh, 190 days that we spent on on uh, on orbit during that mission. Mm -hmm. Well, it's um, quite an accomplishment, and how what a brilliant stroke of luck <laughs> to be able to to have the orbital path cross the path of totality. Did, you, did NASA do anything to alter the course of the space station and make that happen? Or is this happenstance? And, and Ken, that's a great question. Um, and so we are in, we, our orbit is nearly circular. Mm -hmm. and, we, and, and we talk about the inclination of the orbit. And so you have the equator, and then you have our orbit, and in this case, for ISS, this angle is 51.6 degrees. Okay. It takes 99% of our fuel just to get into that orbit. Right. And so once we're in orbit, um, and once we're in orbit, we do not have the ability to change this angle at all. What we can do with our engines is we can make the orbit larger, or we can make it smaller. And of course, we make it a little bit smaller when it's time to come home. Right. That makes sense. Okay, I never thought about that, but yeah, it would make sense. Um, have you seen any eclipses from the ground? And do you have plans for the upcoming eclipses in, in October and, and so, April? And, and so um, I have seen eclipses from the ground, uh, never, never a total eclipse. And so, and, uh, and pro probably, about, I've seen probably two or three eclipses over the years. Uh, there, were, of course, will be one in, uh, gosh, what, uh, in sort of mid-October. Yeah. And it actually is going to come, um, It's I think it's, uh, it's going to be a ring of fire eclipse. Mm -hmm. Yes. And 
it actually will go on a, I think it's a northwest to southeast um, ground track across central Texas. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'll be in Florida that week, so I won't be in a good position to look at it. However, next year, 2024, uh, and I believe this one's in April, uh, it will be a total, it'll be a total solar eclipse, and it's going to track southwest to northeast Mm -hmm. um, over central Texas, right. and uh, as luck would have it, um, my younger daughter's uh, mother and father-in-law own a ranch that will be right in the middle of the ground track, and so nice. um, we, we, we've already made uh, reservations to pitch a tent somewhere on their, nice. ranch, their ranch on that day. Actually, Good. I think actually I think they're going to let us stay in one of the rooms in, in the in the ranch house. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Just bring bring goodies with you when you come over. You know. Um, all right. Uh, one of one of the the administrative tasks you had at NASA was running the astronaut safety office, and based on that experience, what would you give? What advice would you give to teachers as they're preparing students to safely view this event? Well, uh, unfortunately, um, by my very character, I'm a I, I'm a risk taker. I'm willing to take risks, you yeah. know. But there are some things that the 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 cost of a, making a bad decision are just I mean really bad. Yeah. Uh, and so my recommendation to teachers is to stress to young people, you know, to ask them how important is your vision. You know, how would you like to ruin your eyesight? Not right. just for not, and it, it's not going to be just just like looking at a bright light and blinking a few times and it'll come back. Yeah, you really don't want to ruin your eyesight for the rest of your life. For the rest of your lives, and we're talking young people. I mean, we're talking these are the only eyes you're going to have, and so you really need to take. You, you just need to do the smart thing. And there are so many easy ways, simple things that you can do to get a great view of the uh, of the solar eclipse. And so, be patient. You'll have plenty of time, and be smart. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you a kind of a philosophical science question here. What does the overview effect mean for you? Well, funny you should ask. I actually have a copy of the book, oh, The cool. Overview Effect, <laughs> um, which is uh, written by a gentleman named Frank White. And what Frank does is he period and he updates his book periodically. He interviews astronauts to ask them about what was their emotional, uh, intellectual, uh, just their visceral, their, their gut response to seeing Earth for the first time. And uh, the, the pictures of Earth from space are just breathtaking. But if you just think about, for example, if you go to the beach or to the mountains, I mean, you've seen pictures of the mountains before, but how spectacular are they when you see them with your own eyes? And so the, 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 the variations in color, the actual texture, you actually can see the, you can actually see the, the 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 some depth, like you can look at clouds shooting up, and you can actually tell that they are maybe not a lot closer, but they are you know five ten miles closer to you than than the rest of the Earth, and so um, the the vivid the vivid reality of it takes your breath away. Um, and I talk about the colors the. The colors are more vivid. Black is more vivid. And so it really strikes home that the earth is not just what you see when you walk out in your front yard. The earth is something much more important than that. And the converse of that is we realize it really drives home how insignificant we are as individuals. I mean, humanity is fabulous as our as a total population living on Earth, but we as individuals are just 
really ins insignificant and it makes you truly understand how important it is to take care of our, our home planet. It is, I mean, it is valuable beyond belief. I mean, you can see here, I am sitting here in uh, short sleeve shirts and, um, you know, for, for all you know, I've got on Bermuda shorts uh, underneath the desk and I can walk outside like that. I mean, it's hotter than blazes here in Houston uh, this summer, but I can walk outside uh, just like that. And I'm sure it's hotter than blazes in the tobacco fields in Robinson <laughs> County as well. Yep. Um, because, because I worked in the fields when I was a kid, so I... I can remember that vividly. But yes. there's only one planet in this solar system on which we can walk outside in shirt sleeves. Um, we think there might be other planets uh, or in the universe that are Earth-like, but they are so far away. Yeah. In our lifetimes, we will never be able to go there. So... This planet is important, and we need to. We really, we have an obligation to be good stewards of Earth, and that means we have an obligation to take care of to take care of our home planet. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, all right, this, I have a burning physics question for you. <laughs> tell me about tell me about gravity in space. Well, because so many okay. people think uh, gravity doesn't exist out there. <laughs> well, and that and, and that's kind of interesting. If there was no gravity in space, we could not orbit the Earth. Okay, mm -hmm. how does that make sense? Well, oh, I got a baseball here. <laughs> okay, so let's imagine this baseball is uh, is and it's awfully white, isn't it? Let's imagine this baseball is uh, is 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 Earth. Okay, this baseball is Earth. Now, you've, I'm sure you've heard the expression, what goes up must come down. And that's absolutely true. If you launched from Earth and went straight up, you would eventually run out of fuel um, and you wouldn't be that high. You, maybe you would be 100 miles. And then when you ran out of fuel, your rocket would come right back down. And so what's important is not only do we go up to get out of the atmosphere because the air would slow us down. Yeah, that is a, that is a Houston Astros baseball, by the way. And so not only do we go up, we go, we go tangentially, we go horizontally over the Earth's surface. And now at an altitude of 250 miles, our gravity is still 90% as strong as it is here on the ground. Right. And so and so it's trying to pull you down. And now when we're talking about physics, remember um, Newton's first law, uh, an object at rest tends to stay at rest. An object in motion tends to stay in motion on the, at the same speed and the same direction. And so as we're traveling at 17,500 miles an hour, our spaceship really wants to just go that way. Mm -hmm. But gravity is pulling it down. And so remember Newton's second law is force equals mass times acceleration. Well, you know, acceleration can be if you go from zero to 17,500 miles an hour, you're accelerating. Your velocity is increasing, so that's acceleration. But also, velocity is not just a number. Velocity is something called a vector. And that means it has not only a number, a magnitude, it has a direction. And so as I'm trying to go along at 17,500 miles an hour, gravity is pulling me down all the time and so that's the force equals mass times acceleration. So the force is gravity. The mass is the mass of our little of our uh, space station. And so gravity is gravity is pulling us around. And the resultant acceleration is that we follow a curved path, a circular path around the Earth that remains parallel to the surface of the Earth. So why does it look like you're floating? Well, because you're always falling. Right. 
And so, and so you are, you, you are, if you notice in an elevator, when you first start going down in an elevator, your stomach might feel like it has butterflies in it because for a, for a, just for an instant, you are, you are moving downward, you are accelerating downward. And so because, um, because you're, you're free falling, you're falling freely and you can't fall any faster than what gravity pulls you. And so gravity pulls you down. Um, so at that altitude, it's uh, about 90%. So it's pulling you down at about nine meters per second squared. And so if you are dropping at exactly the rate of acceleration uh, that the Earth's gravity is it, due to the Earth's gravity, then you float inside your spaceship. And so the floating is relative to something else. And if you go outside in a spacewalk, you're floating relative to the surface of the Earth. Excellent. Um, now, in your personal history, you applied for NASA many times before you actually became an astronaut. I did. And I, I would love for you to speak to our students about perseverance and grit and what it did for you. Well, I don't know about grit. Um, you know, another word for perseverance is being stubborn. Um, the, but, um, and, and so uh, my military career was in the Army. And when I first, uh, when I first joined the Army, there were no astronauts from the Army. The, the military astronauts all came from the Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps. And, um, but in 1978, NASA selected 35 new astronauts specifically for the space shuttle program. Right. And this included the first six women uh, to be astronauts. We, and, so, right. and so we had never had women or minorities as astronauts before. So we selected the first six women, the first three African Americans, the first Asian American, and what caught my eye was we selected the first astronaut from the Army. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, why not? You know, I, you, you know, I, I, I'm willing to go out and spend ten dollars and buy a lottery ticket and don't expect to win. So why not go ahead and apply for the astronaut program? <laughs> It'll just be fun. And uh, of course, I wasn't selected. Um, that was for the 1980 astronaut group. And so I completed six more applications uh, between 1980 and end of 1989. So that's seven applications in total. And I was then selected for the uh, astronaut class of 1990. Um, and now, I, now what I think really happened is, is the selection committee they were looking at my seventh application and they said he he he's not he he doesn't get the message we, he's, he he isn't taking the hint he's going even though we even though we're we don't want him we, he's going to keep applying but we don't want to read any more application any of his applications either so we'll just let him in just to get him to shut up so follow when you really care about something, be persistent and don't give up no matter what. Well, right? and, and, and also keep yourself in a good place. Um, while I was even so for that 10 years, I was continuing to do things that enhanced my qualifications and my experience. And so when I first applied, I had a bachelor's degree in engineering, and I was flying helicopters uh, out of Savannah, Georgia. Um, later, I then went to uh, Georgia Tech, uh, got a, uh, a graduate degree in aerospace engineering, um, taught aerospace engineering for three years at West Point, uh, then went to the Navy Test Pilot School. And so... And so my career, I was doing the things I wanted to do in my career. My career was going, it, it was going where I wanted it to go. I, it, I loved what I was doing. And so if I'd never become an astronaut, I would have been disappointed, but I still would have been in a place where I loved what I was doing. Uh, something to think about is a saying that I really like, and that is, 
if you love what you do, you will never work a day in your life. Amen. Amen, brother. Amen. <laughs> well, everybody, um, we're going to wrap this thing up pretty quickly here. Um, hopefully, you'll learn a great deal about eclipses and using simple resources uh, with your students to teach them to safely view this eclipse. Um, I'm honored to have had uh, retired Colonel Bill MacArthur, astronaut, um, aboard our Zoom meeting today. Um, and Bill, thank you so much for everything you've done and you know everything you're doing. Well, well, Ken, I, you know, I, I don't know that people realize that you and I go back, uh, go back, go back uh, a long, many, many, many years. And so, um, you know, it's always a, it's always a pleasure when I can uh, help you and the. Uh, and the Robinson Planetarium out. Uh, I think it's a, I think it's just a, a great place to go and learn about science, learn about space exploration, learn about our universe, and mm -hmm. uh, and and I just wish you uh, all all the uh, all the luck in the world. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Bill. In terms of sharing, uh, do you, is it okay if I share this with like my network of solar system? Uh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I just wanted to get, I wanted to make sure you were okay with that before I get anything like that. Uh, absolutely. Okay. All right. Jessica, do you have any final parting thoughts? I was going to ask, at what age did you decide you wanted to be an astronaut? I was just curious about that. And so, uh, um, and 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 so I, I like to, I, so here's what, here's, here's how I like to tell that story. I, you know, I mentioned, uh, working in the tobacco fields. And uh, I remember uh, one, of, uh, one of my jobs was driving a mule drawn sled. <laughs> and so of course that, that meant hours and hours, uh, you know, in, in the July and August uh, heat in Southeastern North Carolina, in Robinson County. Um, and, uh, and, and so I, I summarize that is that my vivid memory is spending hours Looking at the south end of a northbound mule, um, my my it was uh, and so we we lived the uh, it was my dad's farm, but he also had been and uh, he had served in the American Army in World War II and was in the reserves at that time. And so, um, you know, when I when I was I, I turned ten right after Gagarin flew, and so when I was beginning to learn what careers were out there, astronaut really was. A pretty new thing, and so I, I and I idolized my dad. My dad was my hero, and so uh, you know the options were uh, be a farmer or be uh, what I thought the options were was being a farmer or being a soldier, and so that's what I wanted to do. Um, and then uh, as I as I mentioned, uh, and then in 1978, I suddenly realized I could be a soldier and. Maybe if I was really lucky, I could become an astronaut as well. I have one more question and I'll let you go with my questions. I'm a former journalist, I'm sorry. Um, so what is one quality, if you can sum it up, that makes a great astronaut um, for the kids? Yeah, and so uh, I think it's curiosity. Um, and you know, if you're really curious about things, you're more in, you're more open to learning. And um, you know, a commitment to a, a lifetime a lifetime commitment to learning uh, is you know it just is a hard it's hard to beat. Um, it uh, and, and so the curiosity, uh, being committed to learning, I, I think those are really important. And for goodness' sake, do the best you can in school. Uh, pay attention to teachers. Just do the best you can in school. Doesn't mean good grades. Doesn't mean getting all A's. It just means learning as much as you can. Okay. Well, kids, that about wraps it up. Teachers, that about wraps it up. Um, thank you very much for coming today. And Bill, of course, thank you for taking time to be with us. Oh, and it's a pleasure, Ken. And, and Jessica, nice to meet you virtually. <laughs> nice to meet you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> hey, uh, Jessica, where are you from originally? Orem, North Carolina. Oh, cool! I know where that is. The uh, and uh, and I, 
and and I and I say that because I just you know I love talking to people who are from originally back home because you know we uh, we have accents and I just love the familiarity of yours. Mine, unfortunately, has been contaminated by living in Texas for 36 years. So I've got a North Carolina accent that's been that's got been overlaid with a lot of Texas something. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Well, I no, no, you just I just love hearing your voice. It's 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 a good thing. Don't don't ever don't ever try to get rid of it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right. Well, everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you so much. And